I'll tell you what, um, can you guys hear me okay? The sound? I don't know, I've got like four mics. So um, I, I'm here today, I just wanna thank you again for coming. Um, as you know, we sat down uh, about this time last year after having the first conference. We, just, we wanted to decide on a theme in, in a way in which we could sort of move the discussion forward, okay? Um, and a lot of you who were here last year, you know that our, what we sort of set our sights on was going beyond this idea of sort of this human trafficking 101, raising awareness to the next step. And the next step we decided would be trying to network with others like yourselves, okay? And the reason why that's so important, and, and trust me, I've been inspired by so many people in this room when I go to different task force meetings, whether that's you know, with, with Claire and Crossroads Community Church and, and folks over in Calhoun County, or it's, it's you know, um, um, Kelly and Julie and others in Lenaway County, or even meeting with Jane and doing things like that, I'm constantly inspired and um, challenged to grow in some really unique ways. Um, uh, Dr. John Hawthorne has really sort of stepped up this year and, and helped with this. I've been really blessed. I mean, it's been a sort of a whirlwind last 24 hours, if you can imagine. Um, it's been a great time with my department last night with Chia and Lori McVeigh at the Switchfoot concert. And then today, you know, Hawthorne has really, really been supportive and, and, and helpful. And it's just really neat to be a part of each other's lives like this. And so um, I'm very thankful to be here. Now, what I'd like to talk about today um, we talked a little bit about, you know, um, um, earlier about ways in which we can get involved with this, this, this movement against human trafficking. And the goal has been not only to raise, continue to raise awareness, because not everybody here knows a ton about human trafficking, but, you know, it's been to raise awareness, raise awareness, and now we're trying to sort of connect you. And so what I'd like to do is just lay out a model. It, it's not the model by any means but it's a model that we find that, that, that's, that's kind of worked for us. But Jane's exactly right. You know, it's two, three steps forward, and then it's a few back, right? And you gotta just keep moving forward. And so, you know, your very presence here has been an encouragement in that way. And so what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about our coalition against human trafficking, some of our partners, and ways in which we can potentially network in the future. Now, the, the framework that I'll use, this is sort of a timeline, okay? I'll start with the awareness piece, and then we'll go to research opportunities, we'll go to networking and relationship building opportunities, then we'll talk about informed advocacy, and then advocacy will transition into sustainable social change. So this is sort of the model we've been working with, okay? It's, again, it's a model, not the model, okay? Um, there's a lot that we have to learn. Um, the process of becoming aware about human trafficking, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of like many of you. I started reading about human trafficking and really didn't even realize it as such, okay? Uh, when I was an undergrad here at Spring Arbor, you know, I started reading some books by Gary Haugen from International Justice Mission. Was later fortunate enough to do an internship with them while in law school. But these are sort of the early parts of, you know, my sort of um, formation in terms of learning about this issue was just by doing my work in college, like doing reading and, and, and learning from other people. Um, and also part of it is, is this is who we are. Doing justice is, is who we are. And by justice, I don't mean, you know, Tim Keller talks in Generous Justice about this idea of justice being, you know, is getting what you deserve, okay? Now he sort of analyzes this idea of justice and says, no, there's a few different terms that are used to refer to justice in the Bible. And, and, none of which are fully encompassed by this idea of getting what you deserve, okay? Instead, it's about right relationship, okay? It's about being um, generous and, and, and giving abundantly in ways in which God has done that for us, okay? So he sort of tries to reshape that idea. Um, this really became serious to me was during one of our three-week cross-cultural trips where Spring Arbor, we, you know, the, the university requires students to go abroad for three weeks. Um, and... And one of the, tri the, the trip that I've been doing the most uh, has been Cambodia. And so every January we go for about three weeks to Cambodia. Um, and one time we were actually, you, you heard about this a little bit before, we were, in a, we were doing some research. And we were trying to learn more about how these red light districts operate in the capital Phnom Penh. And I was actually, this was one of these experiences that really sort of shaped me was a, a guy grabbed my arm 
and started offering me sex with girls. And he pointed to where they were. I tried and, you know, that's when you're sort of, you get this chill and you feel a little bit creepy, right? And, but on the same token, um, as, for me as a, an academic, it's a way for me to learn about how this works. So I'm sorry if that sounds a little creeper of me, but it, it's sort of, it was a way for me to learn. Students kept walking. I learned a little bit about how that operation worked. And we learned a lot about how that happened. We passed along the information to some, to some uh, uh, NGO contacts there and so on and so forth. But when we came back, when we talk about this being a student-led movement, John's not kidding. I mean, initially, the first year or so, I was set to go to northern Uganda on a Fulbright to get my dissertation research done. I wasn't concerned at all about, oh, what do these students want to do now? You know, I've got to, like I said, I've got to stay focused. I've got to get this done. But over time, what happened, is students just started doing research, doing research, doing research, and finding out that this, these things happen in our communities here. And that's when I, my interest started to become a bit more peaked, right? Or become, become peaked. Um, we started to, to do a little bit more research on particular venues in Jackson County and in the neighboring counties. And if, if any of you know sort of the, um, the, the, the major thoroughfares, okay, you've got I-94 going from Chicago to Detroit, you've got international borders, you've got I-69, you've got I-96, all these different dynamics going on, right? And so, when, when this happens, I'm starting to get more interested, more interested, more interested, and the federal government decides to do what? Not fund Fulbright. Mm. So, I started asking myself some questions. You know, I don't know about you, I'm the type, I'm a little hard-headed, right? So God tries to show me things, and I'm like, yeah, but I get a little skeptical, and I'm like, well, yeah, I don't really know. And then he just keeps coming and coming and coming. And finally, I've got to learn something here. And, and I did. Because repeatedly, you know, between Mary Darling, Roger Varland, we had the Focus Series on Human Trafficking, one of the largest attended Focus Series, you know, at Spring Arbor University. Uh, Reverend Kevin Austin, you know, Pastor Mark Van Valen, and some other leaders in the Free Methodist Church. Ginger Coakley, that's where Ginger and I met. Um, we'd go on a, like a 10-day um, trip to Thailand to connect with different ministries that are working on human trafficking there. And so all these things are happening, all these things are happening. Uh, the, the Spring Arbor Free Methodist Church is getting more involved. And I'm really at that point scratching my head saying, okay, what is this like now? Or what should I do with this? And I want to point something out here. Uh, this goes along with what Andy was saying earlier. Anything that's worthwhile is not cheap. It doesn't come without sacrifice. It uh, doesn't come without driving in late nights. It doesn't come without arguments with your spouse about what your priorities are, or anything like that, okay? These things cost something, okay? The time you put in to invest in being, trying to be a voice for marginalized populations, it costs something, okay? And so when we talk about this, this is where, in my opinion, most of the popular interest stops. People are, become aware, they become excited, and then it sort of fizzles when they decide, they determine that they've got to actually do the work. They've got to put in the time. They've got to pay more for something. Okay? They've got to do research about what they should be buying and what they shouldn't be. That's where this sort of stops with awareness. Okay? Now, it doesn't stop with everybody because there was this groundswell support around this movement. And then it started to fade and to fade and to fade. But it didn't stop. Okay? Because there are pockets of people that are very committed, and they know what the cost is. And they know they've got to be able to pay a price to be able to do it. I mean, this is Bonhoeffer, as, as, as Andy Soper was saying. I mean, this is, you know, um, um, you know the, the Jesus Christ didn't come to suffer for our, you know, to, to, take away all, or to take away all of our suffering, but he came to make it more real and present in our lives, right? Um, so when we think about this, this is sort of where the popular involvement ends. But it doesn't stop there, okay? Because the more we become aware, okay, especially college students, but also, you know, non-college students or non-students, possibilities emerge for those who continue to commit themselves, right? In terms of doing research, learn, or excuse me, in terms of raising awareness and learning more about it. So one of the things that happened was we had some students who were committed and who were aware and they started, we started doing research. We started going out and, and I would say, quote unquote, watching massage parlors. We, massage parlors is one of the primary venues where we believe human trafficking happens in Jackson County. 
So we watch massage parlors. Now we don't watch massage parlors in the sense that like we go into their parking lots, okay, and watch them. That's, that's dangerous, don't do that, okay? But we're at a safe distance and we begin to learn more about how these places work. And we spent hours and hours and hours doing this. Um, you know, the, the spicy chicken sandwiches and the Frosties from Wendy's kept us going often. So, um, so we would, I'm sorry, did I say that I ate fast food? I did a couple times. But, but the thing is, we would go and we would, we would learn about these things. And students would, you know, invest time to write these things up in terms of an honors project here and there. Okay? So when you, when you become more aware, you learn about what the gaps are when the research. Do we really know what the top 15 counties in Michigan are, right, in terms of human trafficking? Do we really know what goes on at massage parlors? Do we just hear about these things? Okay? Because when you can do research, you can substantiate these things. That's very important. So our, our current projects focus on massage parlors in Jackson. Recently, we were approached um, largely because of a letter writing campaign that we did in a class. Um, we, we, um, I'll talk about this in a, a little bit more in a minute, but we're, we're putting to, we've put together over the last several months an ordinance in terms of regulating, quote unquote, sex uh, establishments in Jackson. We're also looking into Backpage and how they advertise sexual services and labor services. And, and my dissertation research focuses on indicators of human trafficking in, in migrant farm worker communities, particularly in Oceana County, which is the third highest um, um, county in terms of migrant, seasonal migrant farm workers, okay? Uh, Andy talked about the before. First is Ottawa, then it's Van Buren, then it's um, Oceana, right? Um, and then what happens when you start doing this research is you find that you can start developing these collaborations and these networks. Now, I initially, this is, a lot of this is very new to me. I would hear about these things from colleagues and whatnot. But, but I have to be honest with you, like when I continue to meet people who are working on these issues, it's awesome, it's incredible. It's a breath of fresh air, okay? Um, you know, when the folks over in Marshall decide that they're gonna bring Jim Martin to speak at Spring Arbor and Olivet and Marshall, that's an encouragement to me because there are other people who are also very passionate about this and they're also very invested in this. And it gives us sort of uh, a renewed sense of energy and purpose, okay? Research leads to better opportunities to empower individuals, okay? Um, we were talking about this earlier with um, the Emmaus folks. This idea that, that we need to first and foremost view people is, is either individuals just like we are, that, that are human beings first, or is, depending on our worldview, or is children of Christ, or children of God, okay? Unfortunately, sometimes we put other stigmas and stereotypes ahead of that. And that dehumanizes them. And that rationalizes our behavior and treating them differently. Okay? But our framework needs to be is equals. Okay? Now, um, this also, the research will also lead to more awareness. So if you do the research, opportunities for awareness will, building awareness will come. So, you know, in 2013, we estimated, gave about 15 presentations in Jackson County based on the research we had done. Um, Andrew Van Valen back here is part of that. Matt Osborne's part of that. Some of our students were part of that. Stephen Flavin's part of that. So just great opportunity to do some of these presentations to raise more awareness, okay? The role of the media, we talk about this when we start off in class with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham County Jail and, and our, our initial chapter in social problems. How can we transform what we think is an important issue into a public one, okay? It's one thing if all of us get together, there are about 100 or 150 of us that get together and say we want to get behind this issue. But what, what's the, the shift that makes it a more public one? So everybody hears about it, right? For us, it was a, it was a letter writing project in class. It was, it was one of the things. Speaking engagements, then letter writing. Speaking engagements, the paper starts calling, right? So Jackson Sitpat wants to talk to us. We put it out there in Jackson Sitpat human trafficking in Jackson, we can't prove it, but we really think based on this and this, this is going on, right? Immediately what happens? Politicians, oh, this is going on here? Is this really going on here? Right, uh, what can we do, okay? So one of the first, the, the most encouraging things that happened is then we were invited to be part of a task force in Jackson that they formed to address this. So over the last year, year and a half, 
prosecuting attorneys decide they want to get together and they want to brainstorm about things that we can do with this. Letter writing campaign was this last spring. And immediately, here back, so we wrote a bunch of letters, had a, probably a bunch of you sign them. <laughs> We've mailed those in. Keep mailing them and keep mailing them. And we had identified five or six different political officials that we wanted to, to contact and to target. So we just keep writing these letters, writing these letters, making phone calls, making phone calls. Like, I, I know it's just, it's, we're just pestering people, but we're trying to be as relentless as we can. So I would get phone calls, why are they calling? We got 20 messages last night about human trafficking and why are they calling? And on one hand, I felt really bad because I tend to be really sensitive and apologize to people a lot about when I do things that I think I shouldn't do. The other side of me was like, good. We're starting to draw some blood here, right? So, you know, so, so the next thing happens, a uh, representative from, you know, Congressman Wahlberg calls, hey, Professor Norwood, we'd really like to do a forum at Spring Arbor University on human trafficking. I'm like, great, great. When can we plan for it? Like, we've got these different events we're doing. Oh, let's do it in two weeks. And I'm like, oh, two weeks. So that's exam week. Well, that's the only time the, the, you know, the congressman will be here. And I'm just like, oh, exam week. You know, but what are you going to do, right? So Congressman Wahlberg comes and he talks and then you know, we hear from, from Vice Mayor Dobies, who wants to make this an issue in Jackson and feels like it can get some backing, okay? And this keeps moving and moving and moving forward. And the neat thing about it, we have more task forces, okay? The neat thing about it is you have the opportunity to meet some people that not only will sort of like breathe this hope into what it is you're doing, but these are people, they're just great people. So you learn so much from them about your blind spots, Okay, about things that you could be doing better, about things they're doing really well that you think, oh, this might work, you know? So that collaboration piece, is, it's huge, okay? It's huge. Um, so these are the different um, areas, right? Um, for those of you who sort of know the model that Set Freeze put out there, there is sort of this collaboration from major decision-making in, uh, individuals in all these different areas. For us, it was really just about them starting to come to us and want to be a part of this. It was really, really neat like that. Um, just really sort of came together and some of these relationships have been great. I mean, even at this conference, some of the relationships I'm sure you're making and, and I'm making and things like that have been great. So the networking thing has been great. Other thing, I was contacted by a, a sorority at Ferris and they want me to come and speak. I've never, I've never set foot in a, I've never been to a sorority, but I thought this might be fun. You know, so I, I had to get a permission slip. No, no, no. So I, um, but you know, so that's, those are some of the opportunities that, that, that come up and they're great, they're great opportunities to share these things. And again, I, I view relationships much differently now. I know when I was a student and students, please forgive me for this, but when I was a student, I, I used to think the world had to change tomorrow. Okay. And then I met John Hawthorne and Mary Darling and some of the others in here and they're like, okay, listen, these things take time. So we work as hard as we can, but it's, it doesn't always happen overnight, okay? And so we build relationships and we keep working on it, and we keep working on it, and we keep working on it. And we see change even though it isn't always right away, okay? So research opportunities lead to network possibilities and relationship building. Um, and then out of relationship building and networking comes informed advocacy, okay? And like I mentioned before, fellowship with like-minded individuals gives us hope, okay? I don't know if you've ever felt, if, if some of you um, have been sort of like working on this issue for a long time, you kind of feel like there are these times where you just, you just feel like somebody just hits you in the stomach and it's like, you don't know if you're going to be able to keep moving because you feel like, man, I was really banking on this or on that and, you know, it's just not moving forward. And then, you know, something happens to sort of re-inspire you or breathe, breathe more hope into you, right? Um, and so some of these things have happened when I've been able to say, you know, I get a call from uh, one of the art professors here, you know, J.D. Gardens, good friend of mine. We both came in the same year, really nice guy. He says, hey, I saw this art exhibit over at Albion College. It's about human trafficking. And he's like, normally, I'm really critical of these exhibits. He said, but, but when I went over there, he's like, this was, this was a really good art exhibit. And man, I wish we would get ahead of this sooner so we could have it the whole time during the fall, right? But we, that was when we went over and we saw Leah's show. And it was very inspiring. 
because this is someone who's using her talents. Normally we think about human trafficking, we think about what? Cops, social workers, okay? You know, you pull them out of the brothels and you gotta take care of them, right? That's not the case here. All of us have different unique gifts and talents and abilities. Um, you know, another example is, is Kyler over here, right? A uh, criminal justice student who contacts me recently and says, hey, listen, I'm doing this project about these freedom crosses and I was wondering if, if we might want to see them and we might be able to have them at the conference this year, right? It's something we, that I can do through, in my spare time, okay? So some of these different things, that, these different skills and talents and abilities we have, we think, oh, we're not this or we're not that, so we can't become involved. And that's the furthest thing from the truth, okay? Stronger networks help us see blind spots. I told you I'm hard-headed. I'm getting better at this, but I'm not always good at taking criticism of any sort of kind. <laughs> but what I've found is when, when, when I can sort of partner alongside other people, Sometimes it's much easier for me to see ways in which we can become stronger in the way that we do things, okay? So my blind spots, somebody may not have to say, hey, Norwood, what the heck happened with that presentation, last keynote? What in the world went on there? Right, they may not have to say that, but it may be through working together on some initiative that something comes up and I get a sense, hey, you know, there's things that I can do to improve this and become better and become stronger at what it is that we do. And it's through being with like-minded individuals that hold us accountable, that sharpen us and things like that. Partnerships help us collaborate. Living in silos stunt our growth. Collaboration, Jane White talked about this before, okay? Collaboration is the way forward, okay? It isn't about like, what is the SAU group doing or what is this group doing? Some of the, the work that we've done the most has been collaborating with Jackson County Freedom Coalition, Spring Arbor Free Methodist Church to set free movement, and others that are part of other things, okay? Um, and so this is one of the reasons why sometimes we don't necessarily, and I, we can have different opinions on this, it's fine. We, we, we've had opportunities to partner with national movements, but it's really difficult because you feel like it ties you to a national movement. And normally that entails getting their name out there and fundraising for them, okay? Very little does it have to do with grassroots movement. Because a lot of times nationally, nobody has an idea what you're doing grassroots. They know what's going on up here, okay? So it becomes very difficult. There's ways to partner with organizations without having that exclusivity, okay? So how do you work together with different organizations in a way that can promote and move things forward? It dispels the notion the university is a bastion for utopian ideals. I have no, I have no idea where I got that from. I think it was like, <laughs> 1.30 after the show last night, and I thought, bastion for utopian ideals. <laughs> um, no, I mean, part of the critique of the university, I tell my students this all the time, is this idea that somehow we're here learning things, learning things, learning things. But what does it mean to apply it? What is it, that's why I have my students go out and do community service every semester. How do you go and apply what you're learning? It doesn't always have to be through community service with local agencies. But as some of you already pointed out, it may be you have a conversation about an issue. I can't believe how many people I've talked to where human trafficking is going on and they don't even see it. They don't even have any idea it's there. Well, one of the things you have to do before you understand what domestic violence or child sexual abuse or runaway youth issues look like is you have to learn about them. You can't just automatically see this is, you know, I use that the matrix, matrix analogy in class, you know. And I just pray people don't think I'm encouraging them to take a pill. But it's almost like the idea that, you know, you could take this pill and wake up and everything's going to be the way it always was. Or you could take this pill, which I sort of equate to education, and really get a sense of what the world looks like around you. Okay? And so when, when we, this university as a bastion for utopian ideals is, what does this look like practically? How can we apply this in the world around us? The role of, of advocacy is research, is putting research to work. Okay? I love being at Spring Arbor University because um, I, I don't, my research isn't independent of things that I go and do in terms of task forces and serving and doing things practically, okay? Role of relationship building, this process takes time, okay? The example I use is homeless outreach. Um, this, is, this is something that takes time. It's very difficult to think about going and serving a population unless you first build relationships with them and can understand and, and empathize with where they're coming from, okay? Um, and that, again, has taken, it's, taken me, it's taken some time for me to understand that. 
Um, and informed advocacy leads to sustainable social change, okay? We talked about the letter writing campaign. That's one of the things that you could do, to be honest. You could put together a letter and you could send it out. You could say after two weeks, I'm gonna have 10 other people send it out and so on and so on and so on, okay? Letter writing will get their attention because they'll, they'll tally them. And then they'll decide at some point this, this is something that needs to be addressed because why? Because they perceive it as a public issue and public issues what? Can allow them to get votes, okay? And so letter writing is one of the things that we've been able to do. That's a form of advocacy that can lead to sustainable social change. Society will change if we're able to, to, to roll out an ordinance. Society will change if um, you know, we're able to get the ear of politicians and local businesses and others and they change their practices or they change where they operate or things like that, okay? Talked about the forum on human trafficking. Uh, we were able to get a group of individuals together. We, had a, we packed out the polling lobby, okay? Had some good Q&A time, okay? And, and this is now, this was now more of an issue or more of, it was on Congressman Walbury's agenda more than it was before. Okay? Now again, does this mean the next day he's going to wake up and decide this is the most important pressing policy issue that he has? No. But, but it takes time. Okay? And it takes sustained advocacy and pressure and things like that for these things to happen. Okay? Uh, we talked about the ordinance on sexually explicit businesses that hopefully at some point this fall we'll be able to present that to city council. And we'll be able to say, okay, if you operate this type of business, these are the different types of things that you're going to have to follow. Okay? It allows us to do any number of things, one of which is register these businesses with the, the city government. Register workers, require they have licenses, charge them fees, so on and so on and so on. Okay? And so that's one of the things that we're trying to move forward as well. The role of local, state, and national task forces. One of the goals in that last exercise was to help you develop partnerships in, in relationships with others in a, in a particular or specified geographic region, okay? And we're gonna follow up with that, we will. I don't know if it'll be in 90 days, I'm hoping for, for less than that, but, but we'll follow up with that, okay? And we'll see, like, you know, are, are, what are people doing together? What are, are they getting together? Are they following through with some of these things? What are some things that we can try to do to help support you in doing those things, okay? Um, it may be possible for, for a speaker from one part of Michigan to speak in another part and so on and so forth. The more we share those ideas, the stronger we'll be, right, as a, as a united and collective movement. Um, the role of local, nation, or state, and national task forces, I've mentioned before, been the most inspired when I've, when I've met with people in Calhoun, I've met with people in Lenaway, met with people at Jackson and City, and we've, and we've exchanged these ideas and thought about different ways to collaborate and work together, okay? Second annual conference on human trafficking. So we will continue to try to keep the conversation going, okay? Our goal is, is to, after this week, assess how things went, how things didn't go. We'll, we'll send you out some, some emails in terms of soliciting feedback. But our goal is to use this as sort of like some sort of an anchor so that we can all come back and get together and share about the things that we've done and the progress we've made in our new initiatives. You know, I don't, I, I don't know about you all, but I, I would love to be a part of something that, that Austin Bach is doing over in West Michigan, right? Or I would really be, it would be great to partner again with Claire and Scott Lowridge and others in the, the Calhoun County, right, um, task force. Um, um, or, or students from Calvin College or other areas, right? We've done that before. You know, it's a, it's a nice little road trip, right? We can listen to different speakers. We can do different things. So, um, also was talking with, with David Manville over at Eastern, who just applied for a grant and is trying to do a conference. Be great to be able to be a part of those different things, right? Um, obviously, we, we can't do everything, okay? We can't do everything. But, but we can try to do the best we can to support each other, okay? And to continue the conversation, to continue to build our relationships together, okay? In terms of our, see, I feel somewhat spoiled to some degree, okay? Because I think about certain task forces or certain groups where um, you've got individuals working 40 hour a week jobs or more. You've got families, you've got all these different commitments. I mean, I think about, you know, 
it was like a couple weeks ago. This week is I had to duck out of a couple things, but like you know, two weeks ago, hockey Monday night, doubleheader soccer Tuesday, one soccer game Wednesday, doubleheader soccer Thursday. We had Friday off, and then Saturday we had hockey in the morning. So life is busy. Okay. Now I'm I'm fortunate in the, in the sense that like I get to teach, and I have these great students that are willing to be a part of this and to give their time. Okay. Very very thankful for that. Okay. And so I just want to outline a couple of things before I conclude. Number one, this has been student driven. Last year I was, I was extremely nervous, okay? Got together after the conference um, and I said, you know, I, was, I was, just had the senior class. It was just, you know, Kaylee Heim, raise your hand, girl. No, so there's senior class, <laughs> senior class last year, Kay, you know, Kaylee, Abby, Gallant, Chris, all those guys. Graduated, I told them, I said, oh, what are we going to do? Like, these guys are all graduating. Is this going to move forward? And one of the students said to me, Norwood, you said that last year. <laughs> and I said, really? Did I? I don't remember saying that last year. Um, you know, the group of students we have here, I'm so very thankful. You know, I'm blessed to, to work with you all. And I think what, what I've seen and what I, my hope is, is that we can continue to move this discussion forward student driven it does transform lives we have students now you know working for ngos um both you know in the in the u.s and internationally uh we have students going to law school to grad school to study you know it's like andy said you don't study specifically human trafficking because there are many different causes of trafficking so you've got to address those things but what i've seen is i've seen transform lives from students right because it's no longer about you know um um, parents don't, don't hear me say this, but, but it's, it's, it's about like, you know, um, I want to do something that I love. I know you, you need to get paid as well. But it's about doing something you love and something you enjoy and something you can invest in, right? And we see this with students now, okay? They're doing things that they, they're investing their time in. They're going back to places that they've worked with before in places like Cambodia or other parts of the world. And we want to continue to, to seek successful outcomes. Now, this is one of the things that we've not done well yet. We take any encouragement you have. Um, but, but we need to move forward and determine what are we doing that's working well and what are we doing that's, that, that needs improvement, OK? And so that's why sort of the assessment piece and some of these things come up later in terms of uh, sustainable social change. Now, don't get me wrong here, OK? The man you saw up here before, one of the individuals you saw up here before, Andy Soper. You guys have followed what Andy's done in Grand Rapids, absolutely phenomenal, the type of work he's done. Uh, very inspirational, right? And when we, we heard him speak here last year, um, we kind of got the sense like, yeah, this, this, this guy should keynote because he's just absolutely phenomenal, very strong speaker, very involved, okay? We aspire to do some of the things that Andy and the folks in Grand Rapids have done. We're not there yet, but it takes time. Those things don't happen overnight, right? And so we continue to seek these successful outcomes along the way. Um, in conclusion, okay, sort of walked you through five different parts of, 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 of a way to address this, okay? Awareness, getting the word out about human trafficking. What does this look like, okay? What are some, what's some data that we can latch onto and stand behind, right? Research. What are some gaps within that awareness that we need to investigate, particularly in our own communities? And how do we go about doing that in a safe and responsible way? Networking. Who else is, needs to be at the table or help me better understand that? I can't go to a, 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 a police officer or a prosecuting attorney and say, what is wrong with you that you're not prosecuting these cases? When have I ever been a prosecuting attorney? I guess I interned a little bit with an office, but, but anyway, I've never been a cop. I've never been a prosecuting attorney. How would I know? Other than forming these relationships with people to better understand it, okay? Advocacy. When we network, we become stronger as a group and we're able to advocate collectively, okay? We're able to, 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 to write letters, to petition, to make phone calls, to advocate for different types of legislature. And over time, that will lead to social change, folks, but it, won't, but, but it, but it takes time. Look at any of these individuals, these icons of, of moving society forward. It doesn't happen overnight, okay? And we can't lose sight of the legacy of those individuals who have gone before us as well and who have helped to pave the way and help move this forward, okay? 
One of my individual questions is what exists beyond the PhD? I really don't know. It's like this whole new world. After I get done with it this year. <laughs> so one of the things, I always have these plans of these projects, and here's what we're gonna do this, here's what we're gonna do that. One of the things I've found in my journey is that what happens is infinitely better than what I ever imagined, okay? And the opportunity to continue to work toward this after the PhD is incredibly encouraging. Future, future partnerships and initiatives. What does that look like? What are some individuals or groups that you can have conversations with after you leave here? What are some ways in which you can do research? You can raise awareness in your community, okay? What are some ways in which we can work together? Okay, I'm excited about next year already. Not necessarily about planning it right at this point in time, but I'm excited about next year. Okay, and the reason for that is, is that we'll have some of you, hopefully all of you, but most of you, whatever, who will come back next year and will share about the different things you're doing in your communities. And that will be an inspiration to the rest of us to keep fighting, okay? As you move on year to year to year, and we're here for each other, so if we need support, we need help, we can do that. But that's one of the things that makes me excited about next year, okay? Do we have some other initiatives? Sure we do. Like there are all kinds of things that come up and we decide, okay, are we gonna invest our time in this or are we gonna invest our time in that? Those things are exciting as well. How will students or others drive this in the future? How will they invest in this issue long term, okay? Without them, there is no movement. And to close, the last thing I would say is, um, you know, um, I, I started off really skeptical, okay? I started off thinking, no, I've got my research agenda set. I know what I'm gonna be investing my time in. I know some of these things. And, you know, without a doubt, you know, it was made apparent to me over time, through students, through these experiences, that this is an issue that is important and it needs to be at the forefront of what we're doing, okay? Um, you wouldn't be here if you didn't think that, right? And so as we move forward, let's continue to work together to learn from each other, okay? Because it's only through working together that we become stronger. Sometimes we focus too much on the division and the differences and stuff like that. It's only through working together and using the things that we have in common that we'll move forward with this, okay? Now, do I, do I think that that means that slavery is gonna be wiped, wiped out in our lifetime? I don't know. That's not up to me, okay? Um, but, but without a doubt, from what I've seen in the last three or four years here, it's definitely, the community pays more attention to it. Politicians are asking questions. Law enforcement is asking questions. Okay, and what I would encourage you to think about is, is we transition to the end of this is, what are some of those things that you can do? What are some of the ways that you can get this started? Okay, doesn't, doesn't have to be a full-time job. You could just be doing some research, okay? Just be changing your consumption habits. What are some of those things that you can be doing so that we can work together and learn from each other and continue to, 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 to progress and, and move this forward? So last, last time, I just wanna, let's take a minute, thank the students and everybody that was involved in, in preparing this. Let me, let me take a moment just to pray real quickly and then you'll, you'll be dismissed, okay? I'm sorry, I'm gonna pray real quickly. John's got a couple concluding comments, I think, and then you'll be dismissed. Um, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. Um, what a great opportunity to be together. Um, you know, it's, it's just, I'm, I'm honored and I'm, I'm really blessed to be here and to meet these people and, and to learn about their stories and to to really be a part of something that is, is changing the way things are, 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 are happening in Jackson County and Calhoun and Lenaway and, and other parts of Michigan and, and, and the country. Lord, we, we pray that you continue to be with us. Um, when we, we feel like we've been punched in the stomach and we can't move forward or something's taken the wind out of our sails, you know, help give us hope through people like these, these people in here. Um, through ways in which other individuals that we think somehow are adversaries or don't want to do anything, begin to partner with us. Um, and, and Lord Jesus, help us never to forget um, what it looks like to be a victim of human trafficking or, you know, 
in, in, in any sense, in a runaway, somebody who, who's addicted to, to drugs or, or, or some sort of illicit substance, um, you know, somebody who's in abject poverty, somebody who is marginalized in any sense of the term, help us to understand, to step outside of ourselves and be able to see them with new eyes. Eyes that would, would humanize them. Eyes that would allow us to treat them um, just like they're, you know, a brother or sister, okay? Um, Lord, we thank you for this time, for this event. Thank you for the students, keynotes, the workshops, everybody who's here to, um, to share the work that they're doing with these tables and um, all the support people, the AV people, the, you know, the, the custodial, everybody. Um, we thank you for how this has went, Lord. We pray that you continue to move this forward in ways that would glorify you. Help us to work hard, but to understand that that's not enough. Um, and that you're there to help us and to guide us with this, Lord. We thank you. We give you all the praise and the glory today. In your name we pray. Amen.